in this third and last lecture about quantitative traits, we'll consider the speeds at which quantitative traits evolve, which vary a lot, um, some modes of selection on them other than the directional selection we've been considering so far, and we'll revisit genotype by environment interaction one last time. Um, the data on speeds come um, largely from a wonderful uh, pioneering study by Hendry and Kinnison in 1999, who reviewed 54 rates of phenotypic evolution that workers had documented in 20 different studies of fish, birds, mammals, lizards, and bugs. Um, they converted all of the estimated rates of phenotypic change to units of phenotypic standard deviations per generation. These are called Haldanes um, because the great Professor J.B.S. Haldane, shown here in the picture in the lower left, um, a British uh, pioneer along with R.A. Fisher and the American Sewell Wright of population genetics in the 1930s and 40s. Um, Prof. Haldane appears to have been the first person ever to suggest that that would be a natural standardization um, for speeds of evolution. Notice it measures them in units of standard deviations, thereby um, taking out units of measurements and making the scale of measurement be the standard or the standing variation in a population. And it clearly is the natural way um, to look at the matter. All right, so that's what um, Hendry and Kinnison did. Um, I've made a histogram of all the rates uh, detailed in their big table from these 20 studies. And it turns out the median rate, shown here, this bar is in the middle of the distribution of all the different estimated rates. It was 0.03 Haldanes, which is to say um, 0.03 standard deviations per generation, which is to say 3% of a standard deviation of change every generation. That doesn't sound like much, but at that rate, the mean value of the trait would move three standard deviations in just a hundred generations, which again in evolution is just a blink of the eye. Now that of course assumes that the trait kept moving consistently by 3% of a standard deviation every generation in the same direction. And as we'll see, uh, that apparently isn't what happens. There were, um, as you'll notice in this uh, distribution, which is mostly at rates of evolution of a tenth of a Haldane or less, um, there were nonetheless a number of very high rates um, that turned up. Um, those for Darwin's finches, which we've already met, I've starred with these um, red asterisks. Um, they are many, but not all of these very high rates, including especially in this off the charts bar, greater than half of a Haldane, um, where there are only two of about five such uh, extreme estimates. But nonetheless, those are unusual. So that's over very short um, amounts of time, usually just a few generations. How fast do quantitative traits evolve over evolutionary time? A completely different scale of measurement is most commonly used in paleontological studies, that is, those based on fossil evidence. Um, these units are called Darwin's, um, and they are proportional trait value changes in units of E, the base of the nat natural logarithms, um, per million years. Remember, E is a number around 2.8. The way you calculate Darwin's then is to take the natural log of, say, the starting uh, trait value, then the natural log of the ending trait value, take their difference and make it positive, and then divide by the amount of time between those two um, observations in millions of years. This um, it is more appropriate to large amounts of change that such as might take place over many thousands or millions of years. Um, and it doesn't require that you have um, a good estimate 
of the standing variation for the trait in order to make the estimate which the Haldane's unit does require. So here's a table um, showing the pattern, which is extremely striking. And it is that the uh, rates of change in Darwin's vary by orders of magnitude depending on the time scale that we're looking at. So um, the author of this table uh, looked at eight selection experiments um, similar to the natural experiments, the natural observations that Henry and Kinnison uh, summarized in the previous slide, but so short-term um, experimental evolution studies. The average time interval was a little less than four years. The rate of Darwin's was in the tens of thousands. Um, recent colonizations are a little more relevant to understanding evolution in the wild. These are cases where a species is accidentally released into uh, some place in the earth where it doesn't naturally occur and it takes off. Um, movement. Many of these are moves between continents. For example, Asian weeds showing up in North America or North American weeds or animals getting into South America um, or whatever. But these are recent. Um, so they're, they're actually mostly introductions caused again by human transport. Here the average rate in Darwin's was in the hundreds. Post-Pleistocene mammals that is sort of the time that um, humans have been in North America, um, but, but with recent fossil evidence um, over spans of a few thousand years uh, since the last glacial maximum, give a rate um, two orders of magnitude lower than that of colonizations, 3.7 Darwin's. And longer term fossil studies um, in the Pleistocene and the Pliowin scene and so on, back to several, say, eight million years ago, um, give rates in the hundredths of a Darwin, which is to say about um, three percent of the order of three percent mean um, trait value change per million years. Hendry and Kinnison redid their original study um, two years later. Um, reviewing a much larger uh, number of cases. Obviously their first paper had stimulated many people whose work was overlooked to write to them and say, hey, you should have um, included our study in your big table and so on. And also um, people suggested to them that they should calculate the rates of change in Darwin's as well as in Haldane's. So they did that. Um, now uh, looking at over 2,000 different traits from 47 studies of 30 species, a much bigger sample than in their original study. And what they found was that the median rate of short-term evolution in nature, as measured in Darwin's, was of the order of 1,000. Um, that's three to four orders of magnitude greater than the long-term rates of evolution seen in the fossil record, as in this table above. And in Haldane's, um, their median rate actually went down um, several fold, um, 2.005, that is um, uh, five one thousandths of a, of a, of a Haldane, um, smaller than in the median in their uh, 1999 review where it was 0.003. So indeed it was nearly an order of magnitude smaller, but still um, remarkably um, high when you consider how much uh, phenotypic change could happen in just you know tens or hundreds of generations at those rates, um, which are now based on a very wide range of taxa in many different kinds of environments and so on. So the upshot is, however you slice it, that quantitative traits do in nature apparently evolve remarkably rapidly at speeds you would never guess just based on the fossil record or other kinds of long-term uh, benchmarks. But evidently the direction of evolution reverses course um, in nature so often 
that little change occurs, um, little net change or average change over the long term. And of course, we already saw um, one of the classic examples of that um, over the last couple of weeks um, with the beak and body size evolution of the medium ground finch on the Isla Daph Daphne Mayor. Um, and it's the same is true of other Darwin's finches that have been looked at in this way. Okay, so now about modes of selection. Um, we've been looking so far implicitly or explicitly at directional selection, um, the first of the three modes summarized in this figure from Heron and Freeman. Um, it's called directional because its effect is to move the mean value of the trait in one direction or the other. If it continues for multiple generations, the figure in the middle shows um, graphically the selection gradient, in this case as an increased probability of surviving if the phenotype value on the x-axis um, gets larger. Obviously it could be in the other direction, in which case it would, selection would be favoring a smaller phenotype value. What it does to an initially um, normal or close to normal distribution of trait values, assuming some of that variation is heritable, is to move after selection the mean, um, in this case to the right toward larger phenotype values, um, to reduce the variance somewhat. Some of the variance is eliminated um, by selection against at least one tail of the distribution, but the other tail the one under the higher part of the selection gradient is lifted up, which is to say um, those trait values become relatively more common as smaller trait values are diminished. Right, that's directional selection, moves the distribution to the right or the left. The other most common mode is stabilizing selection, which happens when there is some intermediate optimum value of the trait not too hot, not too cold, but just right. And there the um, selection gradient, rather than being linear, would be um, up and down, possibly as drawn here, sort of a normal distribution or something like a normal distribution in which the highest fitness is associated with um, some intermediate, presumably near the mean uh, value of the trait, and fitness falls off in both directions as trait values depart um, from this sweet spot in the middle. The effect in this case is not to move the mean of the distribution if the distribution is already um, near the um, peak of the fitness distribution as it is in this example, but it is to pull in the tails. So generation after generation, individuals with extreme trait values, those below or above the optimum in the middle, um, have diminished survival and or reproductive success. And so after selection, the distribution is still sitting basically in the same place, but its tails are tucked in. It has a smaller variance than it did before. And indeed, this is sometimes referred to as selection on the variance, um, which in this case, to reduce the variance. And it is presumed um, that this uh, type of stabilizing selection uh, does occur on many kinds of traits. It is, for example, in our own species, very well documented on birth weight of newborn infants. Um, it's bad to be too big and it's bad to be too small for somewhat different reasons, but the net effect is that intermediate birth weights are best, um, both for the mother and for the baby, especially the baby. Okay, so that just keeps traits where they are, prevents them from moving, and reduces their variation somewhat. The opposite case is also positive, possible, and that's called disruptive selection. It occurs, of course, where the intermediate values of the trait have the lowest fitness, and fitness increases um, in both directions, uh, going out to the, toward the tails, of the distribution. That form of selection has the effect of, of um, reducing the size of the mode and lifting up both tails, as shown in this um, set of 
diagrams on the right. Um, so the initial uh, normal distribution becomes basically squished. It's um, flattened with um, in increased variance relative to the original, but perhaps not much change of the mean. Um, this is thought not to be very common, but a few putative cases have been identified, and we'll show you one of those in a minute. But first, a more typical example of stabilizing selection, which, as I said, is thought to be quite common. Uh, and indeed, this is presumably a large part of the reason why, over the long haul, um, as seen, for example, in the fossil record or other kinds of um, historical evidence, um, species tend to sit in quantitative trait space um, at about the same place. The overall rates of evolution are not very great, on average, um, despite the fact that um, short term they may be moving like crazy, first one way and then the other. All right, so this is a great story of natural history involving actually three species, a gall-making fly um, that uh, has females that insert eggs through their sharp ovipositor into the stems of goldenrod plants. Um, the eggs hatch. The larvae then, as a group working together as a sib ship, stimulate the plant to uh, develop a large, tough, protective gall, um, which is just a bulge that forms in the stem of the goldenrods that protects the larvae who live inside. Um, the plant is not, this is not helping the plant. It's just that the fly larvae have evolved a means of tricking the plant into doing something that's good for them. It turns out smaller galls are more vulnerable to attack by a um, very clever and deadly natural enemy of the fly, a parasitoid wasp. And in this figure on the left, uh, this is not the fly. This is a female parasitoid wasp cartooned. She has a large, very sharp ovipositor that she can use to poke through the gall and insert the eggs of her wasp offspring in there, which will grow up and eat um, the larvae. And as I said, smaller galls are more vulnerable to attack by the parasitoids, probably because the outer covering is easier for them to penetrate with their ovipositor. And here's some data showing percent parasitism on a lot of um, goldenrod galls of this kind um, with very high rates of parasitism, parasitism sorry, for the smallest galls. I believe the scale of measurement must be millimeters, although it doesn't say. Um, so right, high rates for, um, for small galls, much lower rates, still pretty high, but um, significantly lower for larger galls, which escape um, the, the depredations of the parasitoid fly. So that's good for the fly larvae who induced the plant to make the gall. However, um, larger galls are more attractive to birds that break them open and eat the larvae. Um, and here's a woodpecker shown uh, tearing in to this gall, um, which it finds very attractive. Um, and bigger ones better, presumably because they're easier to spot and because the bird figures they're going to have other things equal, um, a better, larger meal inside. The result is, um, and, oh, sorry, and here are, are data on bird destruction of these galls, and the big ones are much more likely to be predated, which probably doesn't affect the fitness of the plant much one way or the other, but is definitely bad for the fly larvae and indeed also for the wasp larvae. Um, the result of this, anyway, is that intermediate sized galls are fittest, and it turns out they're also most common. And so here's a great um, graph showing the distribution of gall diameters in millimeters. Yes, I was right. This is a millimeter scale. Um, and um, that's um, in pink before selection. You can see they're all over the place. The tails of the distribution are pretty fat. There are lots of galls of both 
larger, smaller and larger sizes, but after selection through both of these mechanisms, um, the mean and mode of the distribution are shifted slightly to the right, but um, most noticeably, more noticeably than that, perhaps the tails are tucked in and the variance is smaller because, uh, again, a sort of happy medium size ends up being fittest for the flies that made it. Now, disruptive selection. Um, it is hard to identify, and for a variety of reasons, probably quite uncommon, but a wonderful case um, was worked out a number of years ago involving a, um, an African bird called the black-bellied seed cracker. It's a finch, lives in Africa, and birds tend to have either very small or very large beaks. Um, very few have beaks of intermediate size. The birds of the two beak types do specialize on different kinds of seeds. That's the source of the selection, um, um, disruptive on beak size. Juveniles um, of this species are more variable and less dimorphic in their bill dimensions than adults. And these remarkable figures show that the birds apparently actually come into the world with a bimodal distribution of lower mandible widths, the lower mandible being the lower half of the beak that I'm pointing to over here. So if you measure um, the widths, you get um, a large peak of smaller measurements of the order of 11, 12 um, millimeters, and then a smaller but distinct um, peak of larger ones, centering around 16 millimeters or so. Um, lower mandible length um, is initially not bimodal, apparently it's unimodal, um, but um, selection, and this appears to be selection based on survival, um, ends up um, eliminating the um, middle mandible lengths of, say, seven, eight, nine um, millimeters, leaving um, smaller and larger peaks that correspond to and go with um, the, um, the two remaining peaks of mandible width. So two completely distinct populations of beak sizes. The biologist's name who figured this out, Thomas Bates Smith, um, heroically followed more than 2,000 young birds and found that those with intermediate beaks died at much higher rates than those with the distinctively smaller, larger beaks, and apparently it's because they weren't good at eating either of the two kinds of seeds that were widely available in their environment. Okay, let's stop there. Um, that sort of ends the modes of selection part. Take a break and come back um, to reconsider uh, G by E interaction and its meaning and importance um, one last time.